Today's reading is day seven, and I titled this reading, Keep the Focus Pure. And it comes from my book, A Gracious Space. This is the winter edition. There are three editions, fall, winter, and spring, and we are writing a fourth for summer because of all of you asking for it. Thank you for those of you who have posted reviews on Amazon. We so greatly appreciate it. And I have seen that sev several of you have done that since I've asked in the last couple of weeks. So thank you. Anyone else who wants to jump on board and give us a little bump on Amazon, we so appreciate it. It's what makes this kind of work possible where we can just share with you freely. I appreciate that a lot. All right, so here we go. Day seven, keep the focus pure. The competing demands on your time will eventually eat into your homeschool. You will ping pong between getting your kids out of the house into the big world so that they have experiences, meet other children, learn from passionate adults, and become skilled athletes, musicians, dancers, or pet rescuers, to utter seclusion where you shut the doors against that big world and stay happily home steadily making progress in the subject areas of school until you get tired of the routine and burst back onto the world stage. This back and forth is common among homeschoolers and works great for many of them. I'm gonna turn off my little sound here. For some families, it's a seasonal thing. In my family, for instance, we kept the sanest stay-at-home schedule in winter quarter while indulging a more energetic out-of-home schedule in fall and spring, coinciding with soccer and lacrosse practices. Even so, you can feel like two little butter spread over so much bread, trying to keep up with the competing beliefs you have about a healthy, happy homeschool and childhood. Opt out of that maze of confusion and adopt a different rubric. Fix your gaze on your individual children and your children as a group. They are the focus. They are the rubric. Ask yourself these questions. Who is left out? Number two, what needs have I catered to and which ones have I overlooked? Number three, what can I cut or conversely, what can I add? Number four, which child is the most vocal about his or her needs? Which one holds them in? Number five, why am I adding in or taking out this activity? Am I trying to please someone else? If I could have a week the way I want it, number six, would it look like the week I'm currently having? What one thing can I do to make it look more like what I wish it were? Number seven, am I doing any of my activities out of guilt? Which ones? Number eight, are there any activities that my child can do without me? And number nine, are we having fun yet? <laughs> you can review these questions and I recommend journaling a few of them if you own the book. I would recommend taking some time to ponder these ideas mid-year. We'll talk more about them in a minute. Your kids need your attention, not your philosophy or your community or your fears and worries. During 15 plus years of homeschooling, you will undulate between seasons of intense community involvement and quiet spans of time in at-home peacefulness. Balance isn't always achieved week to week. Sometimes it is achieved over an entire childhood and that's okay. I remember that with five children, we made a rule that only two kids could play sports at any one time. That was our only route to sanity with all the driving involved. Think about how your family functions best in this season and then do that. You'll know when that season needs to change by how your children are behaving, performing, and holding up. You'll know it by how you are feeling too. At that moment, don't beat yourself up. Simply recognize it's time for a shift in the routine. Follow through and enjoy that season as long as it lasts. Keep your focus pure. Quote of the day. Love this. Another item I put on the checklist is have a mission statement. Sounds kind of cheesy, 
but having your goals for your children and their own goals written out is a really nice way to prioritize activities, sort of a touchstone for their education. Lori Blow. Sustaining thought. When it's time for a shift in your homeschooling routine, you'll know because you're keeping your focus pure. So let's talk about this. Yeah, somebody just quoted that our children need our attention, not our philosophy or our community or our fears and worries. I think sometimes when we lead our homeschools, we operate from a place of insecurity about what we're doing, which causes us to be a little bit like a pinball being batted about by philosophy, idea, what the recent conversation was with one of our parents. You know that feeling when your parents maybe even compliment you and say something like, wow, your daughter, you know, granddaughter Sherry is doing such a great job with piano. I love her recital. It's a shame she doesn't spend more time with other children. Suddenly, piano stops even being interesting to you, and all you can think about are the ways in which Sherry is not spending time with other children. Conversely, you might be running all over the place looking for how you are going to satisfy those social needs, and then the entire routine of your homeschool breaks down. Nobody can settle in and actually copy a passage for copy work because they're just waiting to get in the car again. Have any of you lived that life? I certainly have. One of the things that is helpful then is to take inventory, I would say three times a year. I like to do it before the school year begins, like in July or August. Again, sort of over winter break or in January. And then again, around spring break or March. And the reason is, is that each of those seasons actually have different properties. Now, I'm speaking from a Northern Hemisphere perspective. I know some of you are in Australia right now, and you're in the summer prep before you start your school in your fall, which is February or March. So think about the three natural breaks in your school year and use that time to just ask yourself, is this a season of high involvement where we're in the car driving all over the place? How can I tailor back the academic expectations to support this season? And then maybe you're in a different season of, this is a time when nobody's really doing outdoor activities, out of house activities. How can we maximize this period? Which longer term projects can we adopt? What worksheets can we leave by the wayside for those busier times so that we're focused on sustaining some kind of an outcome, a, a complete report or a party or looking through a certain era of history consistently and thoroughly. I think what we're talking about then is when I said pay attention to your children, that's where you're going to get this information. I knew that springtime was really challenging for us. We had kids in soccer, lacrosse, and theater during our springs. That meant it was much harder for me to feel like, and we went to a co-op every Monday. It was harder for me to feel as drilled down into the routines that were more natural in the winter element, uh, winter months. I found myself in the spring just wanting to kick a soccer ball around, wanting to take nature hikes, uh, going to practices after school and really being beat. And that's what was fun. We loved it. We loved being able to flex during that season and allow ourselves to enjoy the benefits of exercise and being outdoors. Most of my great homeschool photos of nature hikes are in the spring. We've got the dog and we're following trails and splashing in creeks and looking at birds. That was all part of our springtime experience. So it made sense to play soccer and do lacrosse. And I wanted to be at those practices and games. I wasn't much of a drop them off mom, not because I couldn't, I just wanted to be there. When we did these two children per spring, we had five kids. So that sometimes meant there was a fifth kid left out of some kind of activity. And that could be challenging as well. I was uh, under the difficult situation of being married to someone who worked on Wednesday nights and Saturdays all day. And those were very common practice and, um, what do you call it? Uh, tournament and competition days, game days. 
So it made it difficult for two of us to do the driving. We couldn't even divide and conquer. So we involved other parents and I limited how many kids were participating in sports at a time. You will make your own judgments based on the capacities of your family. But within that mix, don't feel guilt. Feel good about being intentional. Pay attention to who your kids are and ask them to get involved if they need to in solving some of these issues. You know, when your kids get to high school level, can they drive a car? Can they carpool? Uh, will they be able to go to a practice without you attending because now they're 10th ten, grade or 11th grade? These are the kinds of things you want to keep in mind as you're making your plan. Let's look at a few of these questions now, shall we? So one of the things that I had to ask myself with five kids is, who's getting left out? Sometimes we cater to the oldest and the youngest because, I don't know, the oldest is always doing something new and the youngest is always so adorable. <laughs> and there will be those good kids in the middle that we kind of ignore because they feel like they're just doing whatever the family program is and they're not complaining about it. You know, with your youngest, it's like your last chance to put somebody in ballet or how cute are they on the soccer field with other little four-year-olds. But that middle child who just cooperates has been attending the practices of the older child and has been putting up with entertaining the baby, that child might need to be singled out and really valued and prized. So ask yourself, who's being overlooked? Sometimes the youngest is being overlooked because he or she is just being schlepped around. I remember when Katrin finally got to the age where she was able to perform. She was in um, a choir group and she was playing piano and she was a part of a ballet group. And she said to me, well, now everybody's gone. Nobody's going to come to my performances. And it was kind of heartbreaking because here she had faithfully attended everything that her siblings had ever been in, just sitting in the audience being happy for them, and when it was her turn, they were all grown. So I made an effort to get the local kids, whoever happened to be living locally, to come. We sent pictures to the older kids. We had them cheer her on and give advice before she performed. And when they were in town, they attended. So you want to be interested in who is being left out and how do these experiences change over the course of your family's life together. Uh, I had a chess player, Allison brings that up, and interestingly, you know, on the chess team that my kid was a part of, there were only two parents out of the 15 members that ever went to chess tournaments, and I was one of them, and I loved it. It was completely fascinating to be there and watch them, even if you're not a great chess player yourself, which I am not. But that was a really great opportunity for me to support someone who wasn't in a sport, it would be so easy to only go to sporting events and forget that acting and chess and other opportunities for participation also benefit from your participation, whether that's 4-H or CAP, any of those. Also, if you are schlepping younger kids, can you bring things for them while you're at these experiences? One of the reasons I often stayed during practice is so that my kids weren't driving to practice, driving home with me. Then they have to get back in the car an hour later to drive and pick them up. So what I would do is we would drive to the practice and then the younger ones and I would take a walk. We would sit and read a book. We brought coloring pages and special treat food and a blanket so that they weren't just being bored by waiting and they weren't spending all day in a car. It's hard to settle down and be interested in your own sort of schoolwork or interests, if you know at any moment mom is going to say, go get your shoes, we got to leave. And that's the danger of too much activity. So now let's look at the next question. What needs have I catered to and which ones have I overlooked? It was much easier for me to be excited about sports and acting than any other interests my kids had. You know why? I'm a huge sports fan and I was an actress. Those two I could relate to. Chess, not so much. Online gaming tournaments, not at all. I had to learn to be interested in that stuff and I'm ashamed to say it took me most of my kids' lives to find out 
that it was okay for me to sit in a chair next to my son and watch him play a game and just be in awe of how fast he was moving and what he was doing, not even understanding it fully. And yet here he was in these sophisticated tournaments that were being broadcast in Korea and I didn't even know about it. So finding the ability to be interested and to support something that's not natural to you is important. I played Pokemon cards or Yu-Gi-Oh cards for an entire year. I've played more board games that I didn't think I'd like than I can count to support the interest of my son. I even played a role-playing game with Noah and my mom and my daughter, Katrin, out of a desire to see what role-playing games are like. These are not my strengths. I'm not a gamer. I don't have patience to learn the rules, and I have to sort of will myself forward in the initial stages of that interest. But why is that less important than a lacrosse game? The tendency is to assume that because it's external to the house, and it requires a uniform, and you go somewhere to see the game, that that's more important than a tabletop game guided by one of your kids. So those are the kinds of things I want you to pay attention to. You might also have a child who is really into musical instruments, but not performance. I had a daughter like that. She didn't want me to come to her performances. I was banned from coming. So she would go to the recital and play for other people's parents and not me. But I got to hear her practice at home. And I needed to give love to those practices because that's where she showed up. That's where I got to see her perform. And I was resentful, to be honest. I paid all this money. Why don't I get to see you in the recital? In the end, I've seen her perform in all kinds of things. She was building up her capacity to be able to perform in front of her family. And she did it without letting us come for her first performances. So part of me learning how to support that child was allowing her to discuss and decide for herself who gets to be there, who gets to watch. What else? When you feel overwhelmed, you are going to ask the question, what can I cut out? But sometimes the question is, what can I add? If there's been a sustained period of tedium in your family where it just feels like you're on the treadmill of doing the same thing over and over, remember the four properties of an enchanted education. Mystery, surprise, risk, and adventure. Someone can post this in the comments. Mystery surprise, risk, and adventure. What that means is when you get into a treadmill moment, whether it's car schooling because you're driving everywhere all the time, or you're staying home and never going anywhere, it's time to imagine how to bring one of those properties back into your homeschool experience. Sometimes risk is just a more challenging task within the subject area, you know? And you can set it up as a challenge. Think about how much your kids love going up levels in online gaming. Couldn't you have your own levels for copywork passages, for dictation? Couldn't you have your own levels and challenges for how much math, by what date? Couldn't you ask a child before you show them the next chapter in the book, couldn't you say, based on everything we've done, what do you think's coming? What problem might be the next thing this book thinks we need to solve, whether that's math or science. What if we started investing in the creativity of the subject area rather than just the rote learning of it? So pretend you've got your Saxon math book and your kids have been working through the pages and it's getting kind of stale. Couldn't you look ahead in that book and think about, oh, it looks like we're moving from fractions into geometric figures. How could I enrich that experience? How could I turn it into surprise, risk, mystery, and adventure? Could I introduce a Rubik's Cube? Could we do tangrams? Could we start with origami? Could we build a puzzle together? Could we look at vectors online? Could I buy a protractor and make shapes? Could we get one of those spirographs and just play with design and think about shapes? 
Can we do all that before we go to this next chapter that just in two-dimensional worksheet pages brings up something that is so rich with literal dimensionality? You want to think about what you can add in that moment. And adding in that moment doesn't necessarily mean signing them up for cooking school, although it might. But it could just mean anticipation, creating a little hunger, a little curiosity around the thing that's coming. And could you involve everyone? Let's say it's your ninth grader or 10th grader who's doing geometry and you've got littles all the way down to four years old. Well, geometric shapes are totally fascinating for every age, but not everyone from seven to 12 can do a proof the 10th grader might be the one doing the proof, but why couldn't you explore geometric shapes together and start thinking about the role they play in our lives or the role they play in our language? Why do we have hexagon, polygon, triangle, square, rectangle? What are the common properties we're hearing? I mean, there's a word like gone that's got a gone in it, and then there's this other one that's got angle in it. Can we look at it? etymologically, and not just in terms of the math concepts. If we're talking about surprise, risk, mystery, and adventure, surprise, mystery, risk, and adventure, when you get stuck, ask how you can bring one of those properties into the learning experience, whatever it is. I was thinking the other day, because we've done a lot of talking about copy work since Rita Savasco was with us all last week, and I was remembering that one of the things Johanna did when she was in like fourth grade is she got a paper making kit and she made her own book. She, she made the paper for the cover, which was really fun. I mean, we had to get the, the paper pulp and she had to strain it and then we had to dry it and it got to have some really cute features to it. So she made the cover and then we went online and we looked up how to stitch a binding for your own journal. So she took sheets of paper and sewed them together with her own thread and put the cover on the copywork book. And then inside, she was going to copy only the things she was interested in, only the quotes that she picked from her own sacred reading. And she wanted to do it in pen, but she was afraid of making a mistake. So what she did, believe it or not, we created um, a lined sheet of paper with marker that she could put behind the page that she did her copy work on. And she copied everything in pencil first, and then she traced over her pencil in ink for every page of this book. And then she decorated with her own illustrations. The first copy work in that book, the first one, I wish I had it, I have it in my other room. I'll, I'll try to remember to share it at some point. It would have one or two sentences, you know, a quote that was a sentence or two long with a pretty little illustration. By the end of the book, she decided to copy several paragraphs out of the novel called Pocahontas, and it took her a couple of weeks to complete. Talk about challenge. Talk about adventure and risk. Using a black marker in her sacred copywork book that she had created from scratch, challenging herself to go from a two sentence quote all the way to several paragraphs that moved her, that she was deeply engaged in by the end of that book. And the number of pages in this book, maybe 10, maybe 12, it's not a composition book, but can you imagine how much learning went into that whole stage of development, the thoughtfulness, the planning, treating it like it was sacred, so I'm not saying add like add more work. I'm talking about adding a new dynamic, I'm talking about bringing in an additional experience that reframes what's become rote or tedious. That's what I mean by enchanting the education. That's the difference. Are you getting it? So as you're looking at your family, when I say keep the focus pure, I really mean it. Keep it on your kids. Keep it on their experience, not your worries and fears, not what all your friends are telling you, not what the special homeschool discussion board is saying is the bee's knees, 
Look at your kids. All the information that you need to make wise decisions about what your kids could or should be doing is being presented to you throughout every day of your experience. And you, you know it better than anyone else. You get to decide. Which child is most vocal about his or her needs and which one holds them in? For the one who's really vocal, it might be worth it to empower that child to meet their own needs. Yeah, you're hearing them loud and clear. I need this, I need that. You know, Jacob was very assertive. He knew what he wanted. He wanted a telescope. He wanted to go to NASA for the space camp. He wanted to become a chef. <laughs> he, he's, he wanted to play ultimate frisbee. He had all kinds of needs. He wanted to play saxophone. I just told him to do some research. I could see this was the kind of kid who could find things out. Did I support and help him with that research? Absolutely. You know, when he decided he wanted to go to space camp, we couldn't afford it. So John, his dad, suggested he start a cookie business and we helped him. We went and bought the food materials and got him the recipe. And the first time he went out with his clipboard around the neighborhood taking orders, John went with him. But that cookie business lasted for almost eight years. He did the first four and Katrin took it over. That's how long it sustained itself. They didn't have millions of customers. I think by the end, Katrin was down to one customer, but the amount of money she made off of one customer sustained her fashion uh, hunger. She was doing a blog and buying thrift clothes and she could pay for it by making cookies. Not all of this falls to you. The vocal child isn't necessarily needing you to take their hand and do it for them. Johanna wanted American Girl dolls. We didn't have money for those dolls. They had some kind of puzzle, sticker puzzle, for saving up money to buy the doll. We ordered that for free, and she bought two dolls that way. We kept it where she could see it, and I reminded her of it repeatedly, and she earned a little money and kept her birthday money, and she worked her way toward it. Not everything your vocal child says falls to you but it does fall to you to help them see the possibilities. What could they get if they knew how to get it? What could you offer them as a tool to achieve their own dreams? And the satisfaction and reward is profound. It took Johanna a year to save $100. And what was so beautiful is when she was at $80 and we thought, well, it's gonna take months more to get 20, she was walking on our cul-de-sac and literally found a $20 bill on the ground. And do you know what she did with that money? She ran home, stuck it in the envelope with all the other cash and put the last sticker on her American Girl doll savings account stickers on that puzzle. She didn't think, oh good, I get to go buy candy. She had a goal and she felt like the universe itself had completed that task for her. This is what happens when you help empower your kids to have vision, to have commitments, to realize their own dreams. You are not responsible to make everything happen. You are simply responsible to create the capacity for things to happen and to support them and to be enthusiastic and to empathize when it gets challenging. You know, you don't just throw up your hands and say, huh, well, I know it's taken six months, uh, you know, but that's your own fault. You could be earning more money than that. That's not your job. Your job is to be like, wow, you've stuck with it for six months. I'd want to quit about now too. How about I help you make cookies this weekend just as a break? It's, it's tiring. I get it. But you're doing great. And if we double these six months, this is how much money you'll have. So keep going. Thumbs up. Like that. Like that. And then what about the kid who holds it in? Who doesn't tell you? who goes along to get along. Well, they need special attention. You can get outside with them, take them on a walk, go out for hot chocolate, snuggle late at night before that child goes to sleep and talk, little pillow talk with your quieter child. You can start a dialogue journal where you write a question in the journal at night and then your child takes a day to answer and then writes you a question. You can model following a passion and involve that child. I remember when I was doing, you know, Project 365 taking pictures, 
all my kids suddenly got very interested in photos and pho photography. And Jacob at one point even took my camera and started trying to reproduce photos that were like mine. You can involve your kids in what you're doing. It's how knitting got going in our family. I took it up, suddenly everyone wanted to knit. Sometimes the quieter child needs a safe on-ramp to their interests. So think about that. Think about a way to give them that on-ramp. Invite them in when you're cooking. Talk to them about the movie you're about to watch and ask them if they'll watch it with you. Allow them to come into your room and alone with you to do a game or play an activity with no one else present. If you've got a daughter who really wants to play dolls with someone, go in her room and close the door and be that partner once in a while. You know, when I played Yu-Gi-Oh cards with Liam, it was private. No other kids were allowed to listen. We would be in his bedroom with the door closed because he needed me to just be focused on him. And he didn't want his older brothers who were good at gaming to give advice. So it was our thing. Sometimes those quieter ones need that on-ramp to take the risk to share with you what they really want. All right, let's look at some others of these questions. Here's my favorite one on this list. If I could have a week the way I want it, would it look like the week I'm currently having? If I could have a week the way I really want it, would it look like the week I'm currently having? If it isn't, what's one thing you can do? Not overhauling the whole thing. What's one thing you can do to bring it closer to that vision right now? What's that one thing? Is it making sure that you actually do have read aloud time? Is it having a conversation with that one child that you keep avoiding? Is it making space for a mess? Do you feel like you always plan to do art, but you never do it? <laughs> well, then clear the schedule tomorrow and just make tomorrow all about art. Do you think to yourself, yeah, I believe games do a lot of teaching, but then you never play a game? Clear the afternoon. Make lunch and put a board game right on the middle of the table. Erica says that her ideal week would look a lot like last week. Brava to you. Congratulations. You don't have to fix everything, but if you already know in your secret heart that there are things you wish were your homeschool experience, you have the power to make that happen. Only you. And if you're worried about getting through before you get to the good stuff, I'm here to tell you a little secret you might not know. Happiness creates energy. Unhappiness depletes energy. It is never a bad idea to start with what makes people happy. So don't reward people for hard work with the game. Start with the, start with the game. Have a happy experience with your kids. Start with the game. Experience joy, celebration, playfulness, everyone together, and then transition to copy work. It's so much easier when you have goodwill to do the things that are hard work. And some of what you do at homeschool is hard work. Some of it just is. There's nothing wrong with learning how to do hard work. But as the saying goes, all work and no play makes for a very unhappy person. <laughs> it's something like that, right? Makes Jack a dull boy or something like that. What I'm trying to say is this. Usually when I ask people what's missing from their week, what's usually missing is something that stirs up the joy impulse. But what if everything you do is very um, joy-filled and you're feeling guilty about the routine, about the practices that require some self-discipline? How can you bring a little bit of that in with you? into your homeschool that's right now free-flowing, art-centered, nature walks, read-alouds, and you're like, but we've got to make some progress here on one of these subjects. What do I do? Same thing. Pick one thing. Pick one subject that has an incremental component and bring that into your life and talk about it with your children. You can say things like, we do a lot of play here and I've noticed these amazing 
you know, artistic things you do, all of the spontaneous fantasy play you do together, the movies we watch, the games we share. I see all of that happening. And I also think it might be important to ensure that you are making incremental progress in math. So one of the things we're going to bring into our lives is the 45 minutes before lunch, we're going to all start each day doing a certain amount of math work that is more like you're sitting in a chair and we're doing it. And we're going to experiment with this. We're going to see how that feels over the next month. And each day that you successfully get through whatever that amount of math is, um, we're going to put a little sticker up here and high five and just be proud of ourselves for doing what isn't natural to us. And we're going to honor that and see how that goes and see if there is a meaningful development in your math skills because we've given it patient attention for a month. Like that. Let them in on the psychology behind what you do. We're so busy telling them what to do, we rarely explain to them the psychological benefit of why. <laughs> and they need to know that. And they need to know that they can tell you what's working and what's not. And they need the practice of incremental growth. I mean, they do it for soccer. They don't just go game to game to game. They go to practices where they repeatedly kick the same kind of ball at the same kind of target. Why? Why do they do that? So they'll get better at it. And you know, subjects like math also benefit from that. You can't master something you don't practice. We know that about musical instruments. It's true about everything. The more hours you put in, the more familiar you get with the practices, the more your brain develops the pathways that create those solution, um, solution creating parts of the brain that help you to zero in and ask the right questions and perform the right theoretical ideas. You can't get there if you haven't had practice. So you can do this. It goes both ways. You see what I'm saying? goes both ways. You can have more creativity, you can add more routine, and you can decide which one thing is the missing ingredient. Let your kids in on all of it. Narrate out loud the risks you're taking, the way that you're helping create a home life that they're happy to have. Am I doing any of my activities out of guilt? Which ones? Guilt usually makes us terrible taskmasters. That's the main reason for asking that question. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing the thing. But if the only motivation you have is that somebody said it on a board and you read it and now you feel guilty that you aren't also teaching Latin, that might not be your best reason for teaching Latin. It might not be your best reason for using Saxon math. If guilt is operational, Take some time to get it out into the sunlight, shake it out, hang it on the line, and examine it. And get a better reason for doing it, doing the thing, or ditch it. Because guilt creates horrible dynamics between you and your kids. Your guilt will cause you to shame them. And then they will either resist or they'll cooperate, which in a lot of cases is worse. Because if they cooperate with shame, they're learning that shame should be their motivation for doing things. We never want that. It's not their job to relieve you of guilt. That's not a good job for children. And then finally, I do like asking, are we having fun yet? Because homeschool, if it should be anything, should be the valuable, joyful use of your adult life. I am not a fan of only doing homeschool because you hate the public schools. You get one adult life, and it should satisfy you to be home with your kids. We've already proven that despite their deep flaws, public education does successfully educate the masses. You do have a fallback option. So let's do homeschool because we choose it, because we know it's better for our children and because it's better for us as adults, we actually experience it as a satisfying choice. And if that isn't happening right now, well, I wanna help you, cause it totally can. I loved homeschooling. Did I love every minute of every day? No. Were there some years that were harder than others? Absolutely. 
Was there a time when we were done? Yes. All of those are true and you can still joyfully be a homeschooler on the whole overarching as the truth of your experience. You know, homeschoolers are amazing. I shared this last week. They take on a whole career without getting paid. So there's only one reason to do it. Obviously the welfare of your children is your top priority, but even that reason, if it isn't undergirded by your pure, thrilled existence, your joy in that activity, that you love being the person to watch the lights go on with your kids. If that isn't you, don't do it. But if that is you, we can help you make that life a little happier, a little more fulfilling, a little more incrementally progressing. Because I know that's what everybody is frustrated about. How do I know I'm doing it right? How do I know I'm progressing? Well, that's why we have, you know, this book and the Homeschool Alliance and Facebook Live and my blog with thousands of posts. There's lots of ways to get free support and help. There's paid ways and I want to help you. And I love how you help each other. So that's it for today. Before I hang up, anybody have any questions or comments that you need me to read before I go? This was very wonderful today. Yay. I like seeing you. Ah, oh, a lot of you joined today. Thank you. So many days Jessica wants to throw in the towel but she cannot fathom not having the joy that comes with it. I love seeing everything the kids work through. Absolutely. And being right there with them. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you would like to see what this book is like, be sure that you go and download the five free days for free. You can click on the link bravewriter.com slash GS winter stands for gracious face winter. And the download link is right there. Just click on it download the five free days. If you have friends who would benefit, share this broadcast and send them to that link. We would love to add them to our pool, our collective of home educators, helping each other become happier, more effective homeschooling parents. Live honestly, write bravely, and homeschool graciously. Love you all. Bye.